Hello, I'm Amara Jones, hosting a series of conversations here um, on behalf of S FSTV at the People Summit, and we're taking advantage of the collection of amazing thought leaders um, and activists to have an in-depth conversation about um, pressing issues of our time. This is a little different type of interview for me. First of all, it's the one, the only, uh, Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now!, um, and uh, just a general star in the realm of um, independent media, a reason why we're all sitting here in the first place. And actually a big reason why I'm sitting here because some of the first times I was on television was on Amy's show. Oh, so wow. this is a different relationship for us. Uh, out of all the interviews I've done, I'm a little nervous. Um, and actually the longest television I've ever done is on your show. It was like, it was during the midterms, I think th four years ago, and I was on for four hours. Oh um, my God. But you were on for six hours, That's so you right. still win. Well, you know, we believe in giving people um, not just a sound bite, but the whole meal. Right. So, and we want you to be able to express yourself. You know, it is actually quite political that the average sound bite is like eight or nine seconds. What can you say in that amount of time? You can only repeat what other people have said. That's right. If you want to say something different, you can. Like if you were to say, um, Saddam Hussein is like Hitler. Everyone would understand what you meant and you have four seconds, you don't have to explain any reference point. That's if right. If you were to say, you know, presidents like President Bush were guilty of war crimes, same four seconds, but you sound a little crazy. Yeah. And if you want to explain yourself, well, what's a war crime? What are the Nuremberg principles? You need time. And if you don't have that time, it further marginalizes anyone who speaks outside of the Washington consensus. Right. And that's what we believe at Democracy Now! And I think overall, we all believe at Free Speech TV. Let people explain why they come to different conclusions, how you go from A to B to Z and end up in a very different place. And that takes time. Well, another thing that you don't do, and, and I want to get into some of your comments from earlier today, but another thing that you don't let people do is to get away with the soundbite, right? Because one of the things that is supposed to happen in mainstream media is, I, you ask a question or I ask a question, they get to answer however they want and then we're supposed to move on, right? Yes. And not to press. And that's not something that you allow people to do. No, that's true. And by the way, if people are seeing me in Amari right now and wondering why I'm wearing a wool hat <laughs> and, um, and my coat, because I do, will say we're here in Chicago and it's over 90 degrees outside. <laughs> it's because in this convention center, it is absolutely freezing, which is part of the problem of our lifestyle in the United States, boiling weather outside. And so you have absolutely freezing air conditioner conditions inside, right. which further warms up the environment, um, <clears throat> which is a big problem. But that's why I'm wearing my hat. Although in all honesty, your studio is cold too, but that's because <laughs> you got a ton of lights that are right on us. <laughs> that's true. Um, but it's small, so it's a small print footprint. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that you mentioned today, and I think that it's really important, is the fact that control of information and control of who gets heard is control. Right. And that one of the conversations I had with Katrina earlier today, we were talking about Andrew Lack, who came out at NBC. And one of the things he's been very explicit about is the fact that he sees himself in mainstream media as a part of the establishment. They don't see necessarily themselves with a concern to rock the boat. And I want to hear from you about how you think our society would be different if uh, if we opened up who gets heard, and if media as a whole didn't see itself as a part of supporting what's whatever's going on. Well, it's a very relevant question to what's happening here. I don't think that um, Donald Trump would be president. I mean, for as much as the corporate media now is fighting back, because Donald Trump is really attacking the media. Right. Um, and I'm not talking just independent media. I mean, is All fiercely media. attacking. Yeah the corporate media as well. Right. And I, I have to say, I'm really shocked by what he's doing because if, I don't know if he realizes this, so I hate to say it on television, but You're giving I him really advice? think <laughs> if he were to stop for even three or four days, um, the media would embrace him, or at least up until this point, because the establishment media protects the establishment. Right. But because he is fighting the media so fiercely and making it so personal, naming names right. of individuals and networks, they have a natural defense mechanism, which is good, and they start to sound like free speech TV or democracy <laughs> now. They talk about independent media being yeah. essential to the functioning of a democratic society, right. which they should be saying all the time. Right. But the reason I hold the media accountable, and I'm not just saying Fox, right. I'm talking CNN, I'm talking MSNBC, 
they rolled out the red carpet for Donald Trump. Now, CBS and other networks admit this. The head of CBS said, Donald Trump may not be good for America, but he's good for CBS's bottom line. Yeah. So what did they do? They presented him to the country uninterrupted. Yeah. Um, his full speeches. If they did that for everyone, then you could say that's even-handed. They let all those candidates speak. But you do a comparison of what they did with Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. I mean, the Tyndall Report is a fascinating report that looks at coverage. I mean, they showed the empty podium as they waited for Donald Trump for more minutes in a year than they ever showed of a Bernie Sanders speech. I remember, I think it was Super Tuesday 3, <clears throat> March 15th, I think five states were in primaries. They showed the full speeches of the candidates who won and lost, as they should have, every single one. And I think at the time it was Rubio, it was Cruz, it was Kasich, it was Clinton, it was Trump. They did not even speculate where Bernie Sanders was. And he was in neck and neck races in the Democratic primary with Hillary Clinton in two states, including Illinois, mm. her own state. Right, where and she he up. was neck and neck with her. Mm -hmm. In fact, that night, Bernie Sanders was speaking to the largest crowd of any of them. It was in Phoenix, Arizona, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. They didn't even play a sound bite. We weren't planning to do this the next day, but because no one even speculated where he was, <laughs> we played some of his speech. Who right. would have thought it's a revolutionary act to play an excerpt of a primary night speech of a major party candidate? Right. But that's what it became. You know, Noam Chomsky calls, talks about the manufacturing of consent right. for war, for candidates, and that's exactly the what the media did. Yeah. And again, make no mistake about it, it wasn't just Fox, it was MSNBC, it was CNN, the very networks that are fighting back against him now. Right, and I'm wondering, to your point, if what's interesting about what happened in the United Kingdom, uh, hung parliament, basically a de facto win in, in many ways for Jeremy Corbyn is that in the United Kingdom, they have equal time rules where they have to give Jeremy Corbyn equal time uh, as they give Theresa May. I mean, and that's very interesting because there have been, and I think apt comparisons between Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. In fact, I haven't heard Bernie Sanders mentioned so much in the media, <laughs> but in the 24 hours around Corbyn, Corbyn surging mm -hmm. um, in, in Britain with the hung parliament and Theresa May and the conservatives not getting a majority in the parliament. Um, imagine if you heard Sanders in any way near what you heard Donald Trump. I mean, all of the support he got, and he almost won the Democratic nomination. Yeah. He got just by going from state to state and the yeah. people who actually saw him at the places where he spoke, yeah. as opposed to Trump, who could basically stay at home, give his speeches, and he would be piped into the living rooms of everyone in America. Right. So could you imagine if they were given equal time? It would be, it would be a radically different world. And so in that I'm wondering, given your long experience in independent media, having actually built your show shows, um, what you see the future of independent media is, because there seems to be a surge in interest in it, but there still continue to be the headwinds, not only of the change in people's viewing habits, but still the very real power and money behind the heavy hitters. Oh, I think that independent media is where the hope is. Independent mm. media is what anyone who's watching, I hope you go into it. And you know, it doesn't have to be a full-time profession. Right. Um, we need citizen and non-citizen journalists. Right. We need people describing what's happening in their communities. That's right. What has revolutionized this country recently in the last years has been just people's cell phones and they, for example, show what the police are doing. That's right. And that can't be countered right. when you actually see with your own eyes what's happening. Right. And it's that kind of description of what's happening in your own community, in your own life, to your friends, that is so critical that will change the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and one last question. Um, again, I could do this forever. Um, what's still gets you up in the morning. I mean, you talk with a passion every day as you've done for decades. 
um, and it hasn't abated. And so what is the source of that for you? Well, I don't think it's actually the talking, it's the listening. I am deeply curious about the world. Yeah, yeah, My me too. My family, deeply curious. Yeah. I cannot predict what someone will say. I learn from everyone that I interview. That's right. And when people say, you know, do you have pointers and interviewing, listen, mm -hmm. just listen. Because I really do think that people have much more in common than we think. The corporate media thrives on the absolute, you know, conflict. loggerheads conflict. Yeah. But I think if we really got to, I mean, even with Donald Trump, you know how he attacked the Chinese president and then all of a sudden he's saying, oh, he's a nice guy. <laughs> if, I mean, that's the role that the media plays. We don't meet everyone in the world, but when you watch television or watch online or listen to the radio, it's the way you learn about people that you'd never otherwise meet. That's right. And when you hear someone describing their own experience, no matter how different they are than you, whether it is a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an aunt who is an elder of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe or an That's uncle right. in Afghanistan, you begin to understand where they're coming from. And I didn't say agree with it. How often do we agree with our family members? But you begin to understand why they feel the way they do. That understanding is the beginning of peace. That's I right. think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war. Well, that's a perfect place for us to end. And so thank you so much for joining us, Amy. I know you have a ton of things to do. And I'm going to give you an on-air hug. Oh my It'll gosh, warm you up. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks for joining us.